Hi, uh, welcome back. Um, I'm Tanya Simoncelli. I'm the Assistant Director for Forensic Science at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy. I'm delighted to be here today and moderating uh, this fabulous panel. Um, we're going to be turning our attention now for the afternoon from um, looking at um, issues of human judgment and bias uh, in medical and biomedical research and clinical medicine um, to discussing sources of bias in forensic science and the use and costs and benefits of blinding and masking procedures to minimize that bias. Um, in other words, uh, looking at questions of when is more information better, for example, uh, should a forensic scientist be privy to the factual details of a case when evaluating DNA evidence to determine whether a suspect's DNA matches that of DNA found at a crime scene? At what point does too much information about the case introduce bias or double counting of evidence? And how do we decide? So to grapple with those sorts of questions, we have, um, uh, we will hear first from uh, William C. Thompson. Uh, who is Professor of Criminology, Law and Society, and Psychology uh, and Social Behavior and Law at the University of California, Irvine. Professor Thompson specializes in forensic science, expert evidence, human judgment, and decision making, and studies and writes about the strengths and limitations of various types of evidence and about the ability of lay juries to evaluate evidence. Um, after that, we'll hear from uh, Jim Greiner, Professor of Law uh, here at Harvard. Uh, where he teaches courses on civil procedure, expert witnesses, and voting regulation. He completed a PhD in statistics at Harvard in 2007, and prior to that spent uh, six years practicing law, three for the Department of Justice and three for Jenner and Block. Um, and finally, Michael Reisinger, um, who is the John J. Gibbons Professor of Law at Seton Hall University School of Law. Professor Reisinger has a BA uh, magna cum laude from Yale University and a JD cum laude from Harvard Law School. He is past chair of the Association of American Law Schools section on civil procedure, as well as its section on evidence. And his scholarship has recently con concentrated on wrongful convictions, as well as expert evidence issues. And uh, without d further delay, we'll turn it over to Professor Thompson. Uh, thanks, Tanya. I, I have uh, three goals here. One is to link the issues that have been discussed so far to the, to the particular questions regarding blind testing and blinding that arise in forensic uh, science. Um, and uh, second, I want to raise and expand on an, an issue that uh, has come up a, a bit in, in our discussions, and that is uh, how do we distinguish task relevant and task irrelevant information. That is, if we say an expert should be blind to some information, how can we distinguish that which the expert should and should not be blind to? Um, you know, Roger Koppel just pointed out that this, this picture that I presented here is somewhat disparaging to the whole notion of blinding. Um, but but I, th you know, I think unless we, can, unless we can very clearly delineate uh, which things are task relevant and which are not, we're, you know, we're subject to the criticism that we're asking people to be blind to things that they should consider. So, uh, so the third part of my talk is to offer a very tentative answer, very tentative, incomplete answer to the question of how do we delineate what is task relevant and not task relevant uh, with regard to experts who are working within an organizational structure to provide expertise to a decision maker. Okay. So uh, I've studied forensic science, like, you know, like Michael Reisinger, for, for many years, particularly looking at, at how crime labs work. In the last year or so, I've, I've been working under a grant to do a lot of work on uh, use of forensic science in WMD investigations, so nuclear, chemical, biological weapons. And one of the things that's really interesting to me looking at both sides is that uh, there are different blinding regimes that exist for WMD forensics than for crime laboratories. So, uh, for WMDs, there have been, you know, fairly careful efforts to try to insulate technical analysts from what we might call task irrelevant information. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, when when uh, when two different techniques are being applied to a to a particular sample to say determine if it has metabolites of sarin gas, for example, uh, efforts are made to insulate analysts doing one kind of analysis from the results of analysts who do another kind of analysis. Right? So it's it's done. It's done in part because there have been difficulties that have arisen in the past in technical exercises when uh, blinding uh, was not done, uh, issues of contextual bias. And so there's an effort for the technical analyst to work in isolation and insulation. 
uh, and then provide their results to what are called all source analysts who put together the technical information with other forms of intelligence uh, and, and combine different technical areas of expertise. Okay. With crime laboratories, it's very different. I mean, we, we see frequently in crime laboratories, the forensic scientists are exposed to what we might call task irrelevant information. This happens sometimes because forensic scientists participate as part of investigative teams, as we see in the CSI television series. The analysts are talking to the investigators and, and might be part of the team in my, in, 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 in my part of the country. Uh, forensic scientists who actually do bench analysis often are called in to take part in homicide teams, for example. Uh, so they participate in investigations, even when they don't, even when they're back at the lab and there's some, uh, 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 and, and there's the potential to screen them from potentially biasing information, it often doesn't work that way. There's leakage of, of information about various investigative facts to the analyst. Often this comes through communications with detectives. Uh, it comes in the form of transmittal memos. Here's, I've, I've made a collection over the years of some of my favorite things that I've seen in crime lab notes that indicate that, that the analyst doing DNA testing or other forms of analysis has been exposed to other information about the case, things like, you know, the prosecutor left a message saying he's suspected of other rapes, but they can't find the victims. We need this case to put him away. Um, suspect known gang member, you know, keeps, he keeps skating on charge, the charges. This time we want to nail him with DNA. Uh, this is one death penalty case, need to eliminate item number one. This is a case where the defense lawyer in a def death penalty case suggested an alternative suspect. Uh, note the exclamation point, need to eliminate that person. Um, you know, this is one of my favorites, the late print case, you know, our, our crook is about to get away, so please give us your results quickly. Uh, so, all right. Now, uh, there's been a lot of, there's, there's been a lot of publication by many people, you know, Michael Reisinger is one of the leading voices on this about encouraging uh, crime lab analysts to work in a blinded way, but there's been a lot of resistance to it. You know, and the tone of the resistance is probably, I mean, I was, I was very interested to hear about the uh, <coughs> blinding regimes that occurred in medicine over the, over the last couple of centuries. I think the forensic science is, is maybe about where medicine was in 1913 or maybe before, but uh, there are a couple of responses to why, we sh why not be blind. One is the claim that because forensic scientists are professionals, they're capable of simply ignoring this uh, task irrelevant information. Uh, here's a statement that appeared in the Journal of Forensic Sciences in 2010 from a very prominent forensic scientist who's complaining about all these, uh, all these uh, proposals to blind people. You know, I just, I reject the insinuation. It's just, it's insulting to suggest that I can't uh, uh, um, eliminate by act of will any biases that, uh, that might influence me. I, you know, if, I mean, I think if, uh, if, a, if somebody conducting a, a, um, a clinical trial in medicine made this sort of assertion, they'd be laughed out of the room. But it's taken seriously in the Journal of Forensic Sciences. Um, all right. Uh, the second response, which is, uh, you know, even harder, is that basically uh, to, to problematize or, or, or raise questions about what is and is not relevant to the forensic scientist tasks. Because after all, if a forensic scientist is looking for the truth, shouldn't the forensic scientist look broadly at information? How, who are you to tell me what I should be blind to? Um, you know, uh, the, this, this, came up, I, this came up to me early on in a case where I was watching conflicting testimony between two DNA experts. And the expert for the government was testifying there was a DNA match that linked uh, the defendant to uh, to, the, to a, a rape, it was a rape for a woman who was raped and her purse was stolen. And, and this guy was linked by the DNA evidence according to the prosecution's expert. The defense brought in a, an academic scientist who, who raised questions about whether the match was really a good match. There were some discrepancies between the profiles. He was raising these questions. And, and I listened to this testimony as like an academic. And afterwards I had a chance to chat with the prosecution expert in the hallway. And I basically said, well, you know, how, how can you be so sure? In, of your position. How could you testify with such confidence on this? And, and she said, oh, for God's sake, I know I'm right and I know he's wrong because they found the victim's purse in his apartment, pointing to the defendant, right? So uh, now, the per, you know, and then I said, well, isn't that, you know, isn't that kind of a bias? And I said, you know, the response is pretty much, if this information, the purse in the apartment, leads me to the truth, truth being he's guilty, uh, then it's perfectly fair game. So 
faced with arguments like this, I think scholars really need to explain which facts experts should and should not consider in these contexts and, and why. You know, let's, so let's take a, a quick cut at the, uh, the victim's purse. You know, um, it, it's, some people say, one response is experts should consider only things that are relevant. So we can ask, is the purse relevant? Well, if we take the federal rules definition, uh, rule 401 of the federal rules of evidence, that evidence is relevant if it has any tendency to make any fact more or less probable than it would be without the evidence. Uh, I actually think the purse falls within this definition of relevant. I mean, anybody would think that if the, if the uh, defendant had the purse stolen from the victim, that he's more likely to be the, the person whose DNA profile was found on the victim. It just makes, it makes, makes perfect sense. Um, and yet still it's troubling to us because uh, well, uh, the way I think about it is it's not enough to ask whether it's relevant. Clearly, it's relevant. We have to think about how it is relevant. Okay, so how is the purse relevant? Well, the existence of the purse in the defendant's apartment led the analyst to conclude the defendant must be guilty, and based on the inference that he's guilty, that makes more probable that he is the source of the DNA found than the victim. Ergo, the DNA match is a good match. Now, there's, there's something troubling, though, is there not about this chain of, of inference. One problem is that it, it, violates, it violates what Ian Hacking, the epistemologist, said is one of the cardinal rules of, uh, of, uh, uh, of logical inference, which is that you should work from the evidence to the conclusion and not from the conclusion to the evidence. All right? So, so the, the, uh, there's a circularity here in that the the, the DNA evidence, which is, is, uh, is being offered to support the, the, uh, the uh, conclusion that this person is guilty, the existence of that match is inferred from other evidence of guilt. So it's, it's, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tautological or circular form of reasoning. Now, another way to look at this, and, and I've, I've tried to develop an analysis of this in the, in the paper for this conference, is the way that, uh, that Bayesian analysts would look at it using likelihood ratios. Um, the, the purse and the DNA match, I will assert, exist in a certain relationship to each other, uh, which, which, is, which, which Bayesians would call conditional independence. When we, when we evaluate the strength of a piece of evidence for proving some propos proposition, such as this defendant is guilty, uh, he's, the, he's the person, um, we have to ask, what is the conditional probability of getting the evidence under that hypothesis and its alternative? So uh, to the extent it's more likely that we would find the purse in the uh, defendant's apartment if he was the perpetrator than if, he, than if somebody else was, then the purse has probative value with regard to the proposition that he's guilty. Same way with the DNA match. To the extent it's more likely that the DNA match, if he's the perpetrator than if he's not, it has probative value. All right. So, but the question. Yeah, so, so each of these things has has probative value. Uh, but does the uh, purse have? Uh, you know, does the purse change any way in any way the probative value of the DNA match? Right, we can say there's the purse, there's the DNA, they each contribute independently. Uh, but is it appropriate for the analyst to say, ah, because of the existence of the purse, uh, we, we, uh, we, should, we should give more weight or we should interpret the DNA evidence differently. And I, I think this is, this is where we can start distinguishing proper and improper uses. Um, so I'm, I, I will assert, or I'm, I'm arguing that, that, there's no, that there's, there's no natural or pre-existing dependency between the DNA match and the purse. In this case, the conditional probability of the DNA match uh, should not be affected by the purse. And if it's affected, it's only because the analyst is improperly taking it into account, creating a dependency between these items of evidence that did not, it would not have existed but for the failure to blind the analyst to the existence of the purse. Okay, and so this then, I, I argue in the paper, creates a criterion for <laughs> talking about task relevance. When is a fact one that an analyst should uh, uh, take into account in evaluating scientific uh, evidence? 
And I'll argue that, that if the fact that the analyst is taking it into account is conditionally independent of the evidence, of the occurrence of the evidence, then it is one that the analyst should not take into account. Uh, conditional independence then becomes a criterion for task relevance or task irrelevance. Now, to, to demonstrate that this, uh, you know, to demonstrate, or I, I guess to, to illustrate uh, that this criterion has at least some value, uh, what I tried to do in the paper is talk about the consequences of breaking this rule for the value of the evidence presented to the trier of fact. So in other words, I'm, I'm asking uh, what, what value will the jury who hears about uh, two pieces of evidence get from, from the two pieces of evidence? In the paper, I'm sorry to shift examples on you here. In the paper, I used uh, an eyewitness identification and, and an analyst, uh, uh, a latent print analyst calling a match between two prints. Um, and uh, uh, look, and then and I model it using Bayes nets uh, to look at the inferential value of these pieces of evidence under two assumptions. The first assumption is that the uh, which is shown on the in the left is that the uh, analyst is not influenced by the uh, eyewitness identification. All right, um, and the, we can we can model this by making any set of assumptions we can show about the conditional probabilities, we can show uh, what the value is of the two pieces of evidence occurring jointly. And basically, whenever evidence is conditionally independent in this way, their, their, uh, their, their, their value can be combined multiplicatively in terms of multiplying likelihood ratios. So they have maximum value when they are, when they are independent. What happens if the analyst is influenced by the eyewitness in predictable ways, such that it increases the probability of calling a match. Uh, the, under, under all reasonable modeling conditions, I argue in the paper, that reduces the collective value of the evidence. That is, the value of the two pieces of evidence together is reduced to the extent the analyst takes into account the uh, eyewitness identification, which would otherwise have been independent of it. Right. So, so this is a way of showing, in terms of the inferential value or probative value of the evidence, you lose probative value by failing to implement a blinding procedure when you're talking about something that is task irrelevant, i.e., conditionally independent. Is this, is this clear enough? I don't know. But it, it, leads, it leads to uh, what I have called, or it's, it, I, because it explains what I've called in, in some of my writing, the, the criminalist paradox. Um, the interesting thing about the crime lab analyst taking into account other evidence, like the DNA analyst taking into account the, uh, the purse in the apartment, or the latent print analysis analyst taking into account an eyewitness identification of the suspect, is that that, in fact, by doing so, the analyst is increasing the chance that they will get the right answer in their call. So if you want to know, if the, if, is the analyst more likely to be right or wrong with regard to whether the DNA matches or whether the latent print matches, the answer is if they take into account, as, as long as this other evidence that they're, that they're considering, task irrelevant or not, uh, is, is probative, they are more likely to be right themselves. And yet, by, by taking that evidence into account, they are destroying the independence of their evidence from the other evidence in the case so that the collective value of the two pieces of evidence for the jury is reduced, and as I've shown in the paper, can be reduced dramatically. So thus we get this, this paradox that by considering task irrelevant information, the analyst becomes more likely to reach the correct conclusion with regard to what the analyst was asked to consider, but undermines the probative value of the conclusion reached, the evidence itself. By helping themselves be right, analysts may increase the chances that the justice system will go wrong, and the potential that it will go wrong, that is that we will lose value, is part of the justification for blinding procedures. Uh, and and the, you know, I think this, this analytic effort to try to describe it in terms of conditional probabilities provides 
not a perfect, but at least one way to talk about how we draw the line between the task relevant and the task irrelevant. So, close enough. And that's, that's okay. And can I move without um, picking up the sound? Or I can't really. I can't. No, I don't think so. Oh. <laughs> so I'm kind of a nervous person, um, and I tend to prefer to move around the room as I give speeches. Um, so if y'all will indulge me on that. Um, I also get nervous when people aren't asking questions. I'll be able to deal with that nervousness because that's part of the structure that's been imposed, but not being able to move, I'm afraid I'll just spontaneously combust. So um, my name's Jim Greiner. I'm a statistician. I used to be uh, a practicing litigator. And when I was practicing, um, I would, I, in my particular practice involved a lot of anti-discrimination. And um, I was, was repeatedly confronted with issues of causal inference. And that was part of the reason why I went back to uh, get a PhD in statistics because um, the stuff that my expert witnesses was giving, were giving me at that time, I just didn't believe it. Didn't believe any of it. And so it was a good thing that I was not required to believe it in order to present it as a litigator, because otherwise I would have had no evidence. Um, for what it was worth, I consoled myself with the thought that I didn't believe what the other side produced either. Um, so I decided I'd go back to get a PhD in statistics and to see if I could do any better. Um, and one of the things that I learned about was uh, a, 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 one of the things I'd like to talk with you about was a statistical technique um, that happened to involve blinding. And there are two somewhat uh, uh, odd things about the statistical technique. One is I had absolutely nothing to do with its formulation. And so what I'm going to talk to you about is something that I had absolutely nothing to do with, uh, with creating this, this technique. And the second is that it was originally developed not to solve the problem uh, uh, of, of corruption of expert witnesses and decision makers. It was instead developed to solve the problem of um, achieving comparable groups when randomization is impossible or unethical uh, or in some way un in unfeasible. Um, so there has, uh, we've had some previous discussions and presentations in the morning um, about the relationship between blinding and how blinding became part of the randomized control trial. Obviously, blinding and randomization are quite distinct concepts. One can do one without the other. And almost all of my work now involves randomization and when I can't blind, uh, because it involves randomization of, of, of legal uh, uh, and, and uh, legal assistance and, and court, uh, court administration. Nevertheless, this particular statistical technique was developed in order to try to ape randomization, the results of a randomized control trial. Um, and in doing so, they discovered a way uh, to, um, uh, to blind. Uh, they, being the statisticians, discovered a way to blind themselves and thereby, ren their, thereby render their, causal in their inferences of causation more reliable. Um, so start with a bullet point. I'm going to put this in the terms of expert witnessing, because again, that's where I cut my teeth as a litigator presenting expert witnesses to court. Uh, J. Morgan Kauser, when I last checked in with him, he was working for the Justice Department in the, in the Voting Rights Division. Um, uh, and uh, he wrote a very provocatively titled article uh, back in 1984. Um, and he basically concluded uh, that the answer was no to the question that he posed in his article, um, to which all of the litigators in the world have been laughing ever since then because <laughs> we think we know what the answer is. Um, and if so, if, the, if, if, if uh, Professor Kauser was, was wrong in his conclusion and the litigators were right, what remedies uh, are there uh, possible? Then, and some of them involve blinding, and some of them you'll hear about, uh, you either uh, have, have been uh, published, proposals have been published, or you'll hear about today in later sessions. Uh, the second of those uh, techniques, court-appointed experts, we cannot seem to get courts to appoint experts. They just simply won't do it. Judges just simply will not do it. Um, and it might be a whole psychological study uh, as to why they don't do it. Uh, the first of, the, of those uh, dashed uh, solutions has, again, been discussed and will be further discussed. I'm going to focus on this one, um, which is basically a statistical technique. And among the virtues, and this is not to suggest that this one is any better than the other ones, um, but among the virtues of this particular statistical technique, it can be implemented with relatively little change in the structure of the way we do law and litigation right now. Basically, it can be done if statisticians simply ask that it be done, uh, 
uh, or if a court orders that it be done in the, um, in the litigation setting. Uh, and in fact, good statisticians are already doing this outside of the litigation setting. They're doing it when they're asked to evaluate the effectiveness of drugs and medical devices uh, when there's no litigation in the picture um, by policy analysts or by the CDC or whatever it is. Uh, and so basically, what is the idea here? Um, well, again, there are lots and lots of opportunities for bias um, in expert uh, uh, testimony. Um, when you're talking about st statistics, when you have a whole bunch of events and you're trying to figure out causation, the still standard model in statistics among experts is to run some kind of regression. And you face a lot of decision points, decisions that you're going to make um, as a statistician when you're figuring out what to do. Um, so, uh, you know, what mathematical form is my model going to take? Um, what variables are gonna, am I going to include on the right-hand side? Um, what form should those variables take? Should I include a squared term? Should I include, include a, a cubed term? Whatever it is, x to the, x to the second, x to the third uh, in my regression. Um, in the left-hand side, what kind of variable do I have? Do I have a zero, one variable, success or failure, or a continuous variable? Sometimes it can pay even to model zero, one variables as though they were continuous. You know, good things happen. The, the, the coefficients become more interpretable, et cetera. And the fundamental problem that I have when I use this technique is that I cannot assess whether my model is any good without generating the answer to the question I'm attempting to answer. In other words, if I'm trying to figure out, say, whether men are paid more than women for equally, uh, for the same amount of work or the same kind of work, and I get a whole bunch of data, like in a salary discrimination case, and I stick that into regression, an answer pops out right away. There's no way to avoid getting the answer, men, you know, get paid more, men, don't get paid more, whatever it is. As soon as I fit a model, the, the, the software must generate an answer, and I have to have access to the outcome variables in order to fit a statistical model. I'm basically trying to relate outcomes to some sort of background variables, and the model tells me the answer as soon as I fit it. That's my fundamental problem. So here's you know, a whole lot of fancy um, coefficients. I mean, I'm a statistician. I've got to have some Greek letters. Um, and the basic idea, again, is why is some kind of response variable like salary in a salary discrimination case? And T is treatment. So treatment is male or female. Or actually, in my view, it would be perceived male or perceived female. Okay? And X is a whole bunch of background variables. And you know, an example would just be some garden variety regression equation that appears on the top. Um, and I'm interested in this garden variety, uh, variety regression in my coefficient beta g, beta gender, beta perceived gender, right? That's the you know, sort of thing. And again, the fundamental problem is I can't tell whether my model is any good whatsoever without running that regression and the computer gives me the answer if I run that model. So then if I change the model, I get another answer. And if I change the model again, I get another answer. And if I change the model again, I get another answer. And as an advocate who teaches law school, of course, you know, I teach people what to do in this set fact pattern. I teach them to pick the answer that best fits what their client wants, and then I teach them to advocate for it. That's what I teach in civil procedure. Um, now, as a statistician and expert witness, that's not good practice um, uh, for reasons of the previous presentation is just discussed. Um, so how do I avoid doing that? Um, well, what this technique um, was designed to do originally was designed to solve the problem of what do you do when you can't randomize? And what's the problem when you can't randomize um, when you're trying to figure out causation? You don't know when you don't randomize whether the two groups, treated group and control group, are the same in all ways except for the treatment, which is what you want when you're trying to figure out whether you're going to infer causation. And so what they did was they decided um, that what they should do in an observational study, a study is to sort of forcibly balance observed variables. Again, the idea being a randomized control trial balances variables, both unobserved and observed. If I'm in an observational setting, I can't do much about the unobserved variables. If they're off, I'm dead. Anything I do is dead. Anything I do is wrong. Right? But I can at least balance the observed variables. I can at least make sure that the treated group and the control group look like each other on everything except the treatment with respect to the things I get to see. And so how do I do that? Well, that's what I'm going to show you. But it turned out that what you can do when you're doing that is you can lock the outcomes in a closet. You can say, don't, if you're a statistician, don't give me the outcome variables. I don't want to see them yet. What I want to see is the treatment variable 
So perceived male, perceived female. And all the background variables, and the example I'm gonna use, it's how long have you been working at a company, just in terms of one variable. But don't give me the salaries yet. Don't send them to me, okay? You don't give me that data, I don't want access to it. Blind me to, that, to, those, to the outcome variables, right? And if you do that, then what are you trying to do? Then you, what, the, the exercise is gonna be to compare the distribution of the background variables, treated group and control group, and find places where there are a whole lot of men or, or people perceived male, and that look like a whole lot of people that are perceived female, and say, okay, in that area, I will have, background, I will have overlap on the criti these critical background variables. The treated group will look like the control group, and that balances, that, gives, that, that recreates what the randomized experiment was supposed to do, okay? And, but meanwhile, again, the statisticians that are inventing all this are, are, are thinking to themselves, this is a great idea, I'll do it. And oh my goodness, I don't need the outcomes. I blinded myself to the outcomes. And so, lo and behold, that's exactly what they did. So this is a little e example that I constructed um, and used in a paper previously published in order to uh, look at, uh, to illustrate this concept. And suppose you're doing a salary discrimination case. You're trying to figure out whether the uh, women who are in the uh, lavender uh, triangles uh, and the men who are in the blue squares, is there salary discrimination? If this is basically your years worked versus your salaries. And this you know, was supposedly constructed to match what the economists were telling me uh, might happen in an actual firm in terms of salaries, that the salaries tend to go up as you work in, the, in, in many, many years, and then they tend to taper off back down, okay, after you work for a certain amount of time. Um, and so one thing to look at is if you could actually see this, and again, I made it very, very obvious, but if you could look at this, and an analyst wants to produce an answer one way or the other, um, you know, you could do it. You could do it as long as you have access to the outcome variable. The outcome on the y-axis is the salary discrimination variable. Um, and the way you would do it, it seems somewhat obvious, although not crystal clear yet, but somewhat obvious to me that there looks like there might be salary discrimination going on here because in the places where there are a bunch of triangles and a bunch of squares, most of the triangles are below most of the squares. But in places where there aren't a lot of triangles, the squares are down below, right? And so what would you do if you are an analyst that wanted to produce a result that said there is no salary discrimination? You would just fit a regression a garden variety regression line. Just take into account, you know, just do that, that regression equation that I put up on the previous slide. Um, and lo and behold, the blue line, which is sort of the regression fit for the, uh, for the men, is below the, the lavender line. And that suggests that the firm is discriminating against the men. It's paying them less. And that's bad, but it's not something that's going to support the lawsuit brought by the women who are presumably the plaintiffs in this case. And we know what's going on here. We got a whole lot of stuff on that side and a whole lot of stuff on this side that's pulling the regression line way down and you're having to fit the whole thing. Um, and so we can sort of see, again, this is designed to be deliberately obvious. Um, but if you didn't have it that clear, if you were having to do 10, 12, 14, 20, 200 variables at once, you wouldn't be able to see things on this graph. It turns out that there's a nice theorem that says that a, there's a mathematical way that if you can reduce everything to one variable, the probability of getting a treatment, in other words, the probability in this setting of being male or being female, and you balance that correctly, that will balance everything else. That's all you really need to do. And so in this particular setting, I'm not gonna rely on that because I wanna show you the picture of what you're supposed to do. But in other words, there is a way that you can do this if you have more than one or two or 20 or 30 variables. Mathematically, there's a way to do it. So what do you do in this setting? Well, the first problem that you have as relevant to this conference is I can see the y-axis. I shouldn't see the salaries, right? Get rid of them, okay? Go away, right? No, now I have no salaries. Right? And if I look at that data that way, it becomes screamingly obvious to me what the right thing to do is. Right? It's just to say that these, these, these blue squares on the far right between 15 and 20 have no business being in the analysis at all. I have no women that look like those men. And those blue squares that are over to the left of the five, 
they have no business being there either, right? Because I've got one woman hanging out there to compare them to, right? And at most what I want to do is put like one man there as well, and that's kind of it, right? But the, what I want is an analysis that focuses between the five and the sort of 14, and I'm going to get rid of everybody else. There are a lot of different ways I can do this. One of the really obvious ones is just cut this up into regions and say, where do I have good overlap between men and women, okay? And it turns out regions two and three. And then I get rid of region one and region four entirely. I just discard that data. That's not doing me any good. All that's doing me is, is misleading me. All right. So, and then I put the outcomes back in. Now that I've balanced, now that I've balanced, now I tell the, the, my client in you know, the firm that's deciding whether there's discrimination you know, to give me the outcomes again. And now I put them back in, and when I do it that way, now I fit regression lines, maybe a, 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 a pink regression line for women and a blue regression line for, women, for men to each of these regions separately. And lo and behold, I find out there's salary discrimination. And if I wanted to, the kind of cool thing, if I wanted to find out the counterfactual for any one of these units, I could do that using a regression line. Say I wanted to figure out what that, uh, that woman there that's in that uh, particular triangle in the left side of region three, would have, what her salary would have been had she had been male. And basically what I do is I go straight up from her years worked until I hit the regression line for men and then go to the left and I get a salary out of it. Right? And that's pretty much it. Right? The point about all this for this, for this uh, conference, I mean, it's somewhat of an interesting sociological story. What the analysts tried to do was solve the problem of not being able to randomize. And what they came up with in the observational setting, what they came up with was a technique that allowed them to blind themselves. And they do it. Good statisticians are doing this day to day in, the, in biomedical context. Uh, so far, I have yet to see anyone do it in a courtroom. Um, and one of the, uh, the statisticians from whom I learned uh, was involved, and he does some testifying, and he proposed it to his litigators, and they just said, mm, total non-starter, total complete non-starter. I mean, he proposed the idea. But you can see how a court might, as an experimental setting, or try once or twice, actually force the parties to do this. As long as the outcomes can be clearly identified at first, a court could you know, potentially enter an order early in the litigation. Expert witnesses, you shall not have access to the outcome variables. You shall simply have access to the treated variable, whatever the treatment is, and the background variables, and you shall submit to a neutral observer what sort of analysis you want to run on, which units you want to consider. And then we will have the neutral observer do this part right here that's on that slide, which honestly a monkey could do, right? and before you know the answer, and that'll, and that'll be it. So this is a specific example of the principles that we're discussing today. She's the expert. Well, expertise, the very thing we're talking about. Before you do that, I'm put this up here. I don't think it'll be necessary. Okay, you can use I this if you want to move around. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to shift away from forensic science now to only a slightly different phenomenon, eyewitness identification. Uh, the weaknesses of eyewitness identification have long been suspected, but the DNA exoneration cases have underscored those weaknesses to such a degree that reform of the procedures by which such identifications are made it, 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 reforms undertaken to raise the reliability of the resulting identifications has become a high priority for many concerned with the conviction of the innocent. This attempt to change the way in which investigators conduct such procedures has precipitated a pushback by law enforcement concerned with losing identifications that are useful to them. Aside from the usual human tendency to prefer to continue to do things that have worked out well, for them at any rate, in the past, they seem to believe that many of the identifications that will be lost as a result of reform will be accurate, and that losing them will allow these guilty individuals to go free, 
at least in some cases where the eyewitness identification is the main evidence. How should one view these assertions? Many reformers sometimes make more or less broad statements in various venues that such reforms as they propose in the way of identifications being done uh, are cost free because no identifications of any value are lost. These assertions have been made about a number of proposed reforms, but tend to occur most often in relation to the reform most relevant to this symposium, the so-called double-blind administration of lineup procedures. Indeed, I have been one of those who have characterized blind administration as cost-free repeatedly. Recently, the distinguished eyewitness researcher, Dr. Stephen Clark, has come forward to agree with the law enforcement position to this limited extent. <clears throat> he asserts, essentially, that every reform will result in lost identifications, or target selections, as they are called, that some of those selected targets will have been guilty, and therefore there will be lost accurate selections, that is, hits, and that every lost accurate selection must be accounted as a cost of the reform to be weighed against its benefits in reducing identifications of innocent targets. First, a primer on the way in which these procedures are currently conducted, along with a kind of trot concerning the standard terms used for various parts of the process, for those of you who may not be familiar with it. Identifications obtained by the police are sought by one of two processes, show-ups or lineups. A show-up is the display of a single person, a person who is the target of the process, uh, to a witness, whether the witness is a victim or a non-victim witness. A lineup involves displaying a target along with a number of other similar persons who are known to be innocent. These are called fill fillers or foils. Lineups are of two basic kinds. Those that use photographs, also called photo spreads, and those that use live humans, called live or corporeal lineups. Since the 1960s, there have been legal restrictions on the use of show-ups, which are taken to be inherently over-suggestive in most, but not all, contexts. So most identifications in the legal system come from lineups, either photo or corporeal, and the reform proposals have been directed toward lineups. There are many issues involved in setting standards for good practice for lineup procedures. How many fillers should be included? How should those fillers be selected, et cetera? Current thought on these first two questions is that there should be at least five fillers, and that they should be selected not by trying to get close matches to the face of the target, but by interviewing the witnesses to get a description first <clears throat> and selecting the fillers to match the details of the description, often called the descriptors in the literature. Uh, such procedures are wi widely, although not universally, followed. However, common practice for decades has included two variables, uh, which are of uh, some importance. A case detective, who knows who the target of the procedure is, either administers the procedure photo spreads and some corporeal lineups, or is present for it with the witness, or that is the rest of the corporeal lineups. And in addition, the entire lineup array, that's the term used, is presented to the witness simultaneously. These are the two variables most focused on by reformers. In regard to the presence of the case detective or other person who knows the identity of the target, the claim is that the procedure should be arranged so that no one with knowledge of the desired target can influence the witness either intentionally or unintentionally. Thus the reformers call for what is generally referred to in that literature as blind administration or double blind administration. The other reform most often called for is sequential presentation of the array instead of simultaneous presentation. Such sequential presentation is said to reduce the impact of relative judgment driving a witness, a witness who may want to help to select the person most nearly matching his or her memory. The presence of a large amount of filler selection by witnesses in every setting, both laboratory and real world, lends some credence to the relative judgment hypothesis. <clears throat> 
Professor Clark does not take issue with the notion that both blind administration and sequential presentation will reduce the number of innocent targets selected. He merely asserts that since some of the lost selections will be guilty targets, these hits are accurate, not errors, and therefore losing them should be counted as a cost of reform to be weighed against the innocent targets saved. Is this analysis right? The simple thesis of my paper written for this symposium is that it is plausibly correct for sequential presentation, but demonstrably wrong for blind administration. My secondary thesis is that Professor Clark has been led astray by adopting one of two available views of what constitutes an error in the results of a process, and then making an unwarranted move from the fact that a result was no error under, the view, uh, uh, under that view to the position that, therefore, its loss must be a cost. So the question, is a hit always a hit? Well, for Professor Clark, yes, no matter how arrived at. But are all lost hits properly counted as costs? That is the main question. The place to start is with the general, prop, uh, uh, general proposition that all hits uh, uh, resulting from a pro process are entitled to be counted as costs when they are lost because the process is changed or abandoned. I believe that this general statement is clearly untrue, certainly in the context of processes deployed in a legal system. Consider a random process such as coin flipping. If on the basis of whatever got the target into the lineup to begin with, the police were simply to flip a coin to determine whether the target was the true perpetrator or not, few would defend the process. But note that this process will yield accurate selections of true perpetrators at about half the base rate of true perpetrators in the set of target suspects. We don't, whatever that rate is, we, we never have gotten any good data on what that rate is, but that's what the result of coin flipping would be. Abandoning the coin flip, therefore, will result in the loss of these non-erroneous hits. Can anyone say with a straight face that it would be right that these lost hits should be counted as costs? of abandoning the coin flipping process. I don't think so. The hits are merely manifestations of a random process with pre-specifiable output characteristics. They provide no information not fully entailed in the original known conditions of their generation. Without a way to tell which in the set of the selections is a true hit and which not, the individual case remains epistemically indeterminate. Abandoning the process may lose a set of true hits of which the members are unknown and unspecifiable, but these conditions cannot lead to a rational treating of the random results, uh, uh, lost random results as costs in any defensible sense. So the general statement that the loss of true hits must be counted as costs in some cost benefit case, in all cases and in relation to all processes is, I believe, false. But in the case of non-blind administration of photo spreads and corporeal lineups, the selections at stake, that is, those lost when blinding is undertaken, are not the result of a random process. So would the loss of these selections, some of which are going to be objectively accurate if ground truth were known, also not count as costs in any defensible sense? Are hits lost by blinding properly counted as claw costs? I believe the answer to this question is yes. Such lost hits cannot be counted as costs. Remember, what is at stake is only the marginal set of selections made under non-blind conditions, but which would not be made under blind conditions. Such selections are a fortiori, not the result of the knowledge of the selector, but have resulted only from the presence of the influence of the non-blind administrator, uh, intentional or unintentional. This is not a random process, but it certainly is not one, it, it certainly is one, like a random process, that adds no new information not entailed in the original known conditions. The selections are the results of the administrator's knowledge, not the witnesses. But we already knew, the administrator knew who the target was. As to this marginal set of selections that would not be made under a blind administration, the witness adds little or nothing that would not be added by a ventriloquist dummy. In addition, the selections are subject to severe overvaluation since they are a mere echo of the knowledge of the administrator, 
but will almost certainly be taken as a manifestation of the knowledge of the identifying witness by the fact finder. Since there is no way ex post to separate the identifications that would have been made absent queuing from those that would not have been made absent queuing, the only solution is blind administration ex ante. Losing whatever identifications are lost in the process involves not a cost, but a benefit. I repeat, it is an epistemic benefit to filter out such hidden echoes of the examiner's knowledge, not an epistemic cost. Now, having dealt with Professor Clark's claim in regard to double blind administration of lineups, that losses of such coincidentally accurate identifications should count as costs, one wonders how Professor Clark ever came to the position that the loss selections resulting from blind administration could properly count as costs in the first place. I believe the answer lies in one particular approach to the concept of error in science and the equation of accurate results with lack of error, which can, uh, can seem, uh, one can see, might be taken to imply that loss of accurate results of any kind should count as costs. This approach is especially prevalent in determining the diagnosticity of binary tests, such as a test for HIV. But one should note that such an approach uh, that may count every hit as an accurate performance, but it is embedded in a total process which cares deeply about not treating random results as meaningful. This is the whole approach of significance testing for one and other approaches to purging the fear that results are no more than the result of a random process appearing misleadingly to be diagnostic. I go into this more deeply in the paper. But for now, it is enough to note that while Dr. Clark may have counted some lost hits as costs when he should not have, this does not mean that everything he counts as costs are not real costs. Some losses of hits do represent real costs. For a variety of reasons too detailed to go into here at length, one can make a good argument that relative judgment adds epistemic strength to some kinds of identifications and that the set of hits lost through the adoption of sequential display procedures therefore involves true costs, which must be weighed against claimed or proven beneficial effects in, to the protection of the innocent in undertaking the sequential reform. This cost-benefit analysis is, is essentially a moral or ethical one, not one involving empirically derived or derivable weights. I repeat. The resulting cost-benefit analysis presents not a question of utilities, but a question of ethics. That makes it an issue in the bullseye of the Safra Center's mission. The paper addresses this cost-benefit calculus and the ethical problems it presents at some length, based on work I have previously done on these issues. But we will have to leave it there for now, because time is short. Thank you very much. Thank you for all of that. I think we should go straight to questions from the audience, because I have a feeling there are going to be a lot of questions from, from that. Anybody? I have two for Jim. So Jim, first is uh, the methodology to describe is actually also previously used uh, in statistical work on clinical trials. So I have a paper with. Uh, uh, Mark Vanderland, Berkeley, yeah. that does the same sort of thing, yeah. uh, where you, you split on, okay. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And, and, and we find it helpful in the same way you find it helpful, uh, although we're finding resistance <clears throat> to it uh, in the medical <laughs> setting as well, so uh, uh, maybe well, that's something it, we have I, I may be able to help you with that by putting you in touch with lots of places where it's been used in the medical setting, I mean, which it, is what it was really like developed split for. sample and just sampling on, yeah. the, on the covariates, I mean, you or could, matching you, on covariates right. without knowing outcome variables. You can actually do it when you get a, in a randomized study, when you get a bad draw, when you have bad yeah. luck in your randomization, which yeah. is one thing I've also had to do before. My randomization gave me a bad, bad, bad luck. And the, mm -hmm. the second comment is, um, I, you know, you, you do a good job of matching on observables, mm -hmm. uh, but the problem is that, that you're not matching on unobservables, yep. and that's a problem. Because I think the underlying economic debate is that you need to have an underlying structural model of what the life profile or life cycle of wages looks like. Yes. So if you know that somebody's going to work for a shorter period of time, the optimal efficiency wage profile looks different than when they're going to work for a longer period. And so not knowing that unobservable fact, the unobservable fact being expectations about how long somebody's going to work, 
uh, you can't match on that. And so when you match on the observables, you're actually not matching apples to apples, you're matching apples to oranges. And so that's a, that's a concern that still remains even after this. So absolutely amen. And what I'll say about this is that this example came from a paper in which I was trying to illustrate multiple, multiple questions and problems when drawing causal inference on an immutable characteristic like gender, because you can't manipulate it. I can't randomize gender. Um, and therefore, it, makes, it, it, it poses uh, d definitional difficulties in addition to statistical difficulties. One of the things that that example was designed to provoke, one of the questions that example was designed to provoke was whether years worked is appropriately considered a background variable at all. And, that is, and my answer to it is no, and I think that's what you're highlighting here, that because, the back, because years work could itself be a function of the treatment I'm interested in, which is gender then it's not properly balanced on. So even though I used it as an example of how you could balance if you wanted to, then I also used it in the paper to pose the prior question of whether you should want to balance on it at all. That I don't think is of interest to this conference. I think the idea is that this conference, the idea is to show that you, how you can, the way in which balancing on background variables, which is the real work of causal inference, can be accomplished by blinding yourself to the outcome. So I, amen again. Uh, Professor Thompson, um, there was a very interesting discussion about the role of forensic experts. Um, and it, it's clear that the forensic expert has a, a very important role in investigations. Um, but, um, you know, in, in terms of the analysis and the interpretation, uh, whether you should blind or isolate the, the forensic expert, um, you know, a blinded forensic expert is, is almost a, a technician, you know, somebody who's there to do a test. Uh, and, and a technician properly, in, reasonably, should be blinded. Um, and I guess, you know, if, if, the, if the forensic expert is actually an all-source analyst, then, you know, if he's participating in the investigation and doing the analysis, then he's really an all-source analyst and not a not a, a focal analyst. Yeah, so you right. almost wonder if you should have two experts. You have an investigative forensic expert and then an integrative expert that will take the technician's work and put it all together, maybe even an outside person to interpret or synthesize all of that information. Yes, I, I think that's right. Um, you, you know, and I've, I've, you know, I've proposed such things in my previous writing. Um, one. One proposal that's been made by me and by others is that there be uh, in forensic labs a, a differentiation of roles between the, the bench analyst and, and a case manager. So there, the case manager could be involved with the investigators in deciding what to, what to test, what to collect, what to test, and how to test it. Um, uh, and that person would need to be an all-source person who's, who, who is aware of the other investigative facts and is talking with the detectives about what, what hypotheses needed, need to be tested against the data. Um, but once it's turned over to the person at the bench who's going to conduct the, who, who's going to compare the, the latent prints or, or do the DNA uh, assay, uh, that person at the bench could be blind, uh, at least for a time, right? And, and then, uh, and, and then could issue a, a, a report based upon the comparison without exposure to these contextual details that might have, uh, have inappropriate influence. Uh, the information could then, once the report is written, it could then be given back to the case manager who could talk to the detectives about what it means in context. So I mean, that's, that's, you know, that, that could be done. Um, even in, you know, even in small labs where there's only one analyst, uh, there have been some proposals floated for uh, how to sequence uh, analytic work to reduce the potential for uh, uh, the subjective judgments of analysts to be influenced by um, uh, domain irrelevant information. Uh, one proposal for DNA testing, for example, which, which we've called sequential unmasking, which has gotten some attention, is that the analyst should focus on the evidentiary sample and characterizing that completely before looking at the uh, reference sample from the suspect. So in other words, if you don't know what the suspect's DNA profile is, then knowledge of the suspect's DNA profile, uh, along with whatever other evidence you may have about the suspect's guilt or innocence, isn't going to influence how you interpret 
uh, the evidentiary profile when making subjective judgments. And, and there, I think there's been some move in that direction in forensic science. Uh, the, the FBI's guidelines for latent print interpretation you know, incorporate some elements of the sequential approach. So I, I think there's a lot that can be done uh, in, in, the, in that way. But can I, can I follow up on that? Uh, the sequential unmasking approach, which uh, Bill and I are both partly responsible for, along with about eight other people, <laughs> um, it, it is larger than simply uh, the division of labor um, when you have a small lab. It, it actually does involve this uh, division between the case manager and the assignment, the unmasking, I mean, the stripping of uh, irrelevant context information by the case manager, who's the interface, and then putting it out and releasing I information that can be biasing if given too early in the right order to the bench analysts. Then it comes back to the case, uh, to the case manager to be put together to, for ex explanation to the, for, of its implications to, the, uh, to, to law enforcement. But I want to push back on one thing that you said about an all-purpose all expert. In the law, there is no such thing as an all-purpose expert. We, really. call it, we call it the jury. <laughs> well, that's, that was going to be my point. Uh, in the law, c currently, we call it a detective. The case detective regards himself as the all-purpose expert. He's the one that's getting all the information. He's not limited in who he can ask. Some of them spend your money asking psychics. Well, that's OK, and they can be influenced by it, because someday it's going to get to a jury and the judge isn't going to let him testify to the results of the psychic or to his ultimate conclusion. So you can use an all-purpose expert in a sense, even in a semi-non-blinded sense, although I still think that the case detective should be discouraged from presenting the kind of submissions that, uh, that Bill put up on the screen. You can, you can do that, but that all-purpose expert is an all-purpose expert for aiding the law enforcement or even the defense by explanation. It's not going to, he's not going to be recognized as or become and shouldn't be recognized or become an all-purpose expert for testifying in front of the jury. That was... Yeah. Yeah. One, one of the problems here is that there's been almost no discussion of these issues in forensic science itself. Oh. It's all coming from uh, external commentators like Michael and myself. One of the things I did in front of the um, uh, NAS committee, when I presented in front of the NAS committee in its very first hearing, was I said that I thought that it was the responsibility of every area of forensic science with their scientific working groups to sit down and ask themselves the fa foundational fundamental question, what information is domain relevant? What information is domain irre irrelevant to my domain? And how, do, how should it be sequenced uh, to be, uh, uh, to be um, uh, given to me as, as an analyst in the most epistemically warranted way. Uh, to date, no forensic domain has approached that question at all, except with the modest exception of DNA and the question of presenting uh, the, uh, the, the not, not characterizing the crime scene uh, sample before you characterize uh, I mean, the, the suspect sample before you characterize the crime scene sample. That's it, so far as I know, and that's been what? Seven, six years, seven years? Yeah. Falls on deaf ears, but we're hoping that they'll get the wax out soon under some influences that may be coming. This is a question for Professor Thompson. I wonder, have you given any thought to uh, applying your methodology sort of ex post? Is there a way we can use it to think about, uh, you know, short of just having notes of somebody taking into account these other facts, uh, can we tell ex post whether, you know, a forensic expert had um, had this extra information or had been biased? Well, um, I, know it's, I think it's a really interesting question, and I've thought about that a lot, um, because it's not always clear the basis on which a, an expert reaches conclusions, right? It's not like a judicial opinion where a, where a rationale is laid out. There's a, there's a lab report that states conclusions. Um, but the you know, the, the analyst who was so impressed by the, the, the purse in the defendant's apartment didn't say anything about the purse in her lab report uh, regarding the DNA match, 
All right. It didn't even. Bench notes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't in the bench notes. It's only, it's only when confronted by this academic out in the corridor where she felt, you know, out of exasperation that I was even asking her this question. She explained to me just how stupid she thought it was that we were questioning this DNA match when, when the, 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 the truth of the defendant's guilt was so obvious to her. Um, and so, so uh, yeah, ex post, this kind of bias is not, uh, is not always clear. Uh, labs certainly could insulate themselves against claims of bias by sequencing procedures, as, as Michael discussed. I mean, I, you know, I've sometimes been involved in doing post-conviction DNA testing, and I've always made it a practice to have labs, when they do the post-conviction DNA tests, characterize, the, characterize and report on the, the evidentiary samples before uh, testing the, the suspect samples. You know, and which sometimes leads to interesting results when the when it when they when the person almost matches but doesn't. But uh, uh, so uh, labs could do things to insulate themselves against claims of bias arising uh, from this, but they haven't seen need to do so so far because rarely are these issues uh, raised. And I saw this one paper later on about how jurors perceive blind versus non-blind experts, and I've been doing some work with some graduate students all along that line uh, myself, but uh, at least with regard to DNA evidence, they, they don't seem to be that much more impressed by a blind expert than they are by an expert who says, well, I knew about all that stuff and I ignored it, nor than they are by an expert who says, yeah, I knew all about that stuff and I made use of it because I'm an expert and I need to know all these things. So. You know, I, 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 don't think this, I don't think the legal system is doing a good job at present putting pressure on forensic science to adopt more rigorous procedures. being polluted with extraneous information, or if we knew in, in lineups the, how much more likely it is to, to get a false positive, or in statistics, the, the amount of error that can be introduced, if we were to quantify that, um, could then the consumers of the information, jurors, um, discount it appropriately? You want to respond to that? I mean, if the, it, it seems to me that it would be better to uh, adopt more rigorous procedures in the first place than to try to ask jurors who are fuzzy on these concepts anyway to correct for it afterwards. I mean, and there, are, there, are, there are some data that have been collected on the, the consequences in terms of increased false positive rates in the eyewitness uh, area that maybe Michael can address more. So we do know that, we do know that um, uh, you know, failing, failing to blind the person who's running the lineup leads to higher rates of false positives. Um, there's some, you know, with regard to forensic science, there's, it's all anecdotal. There's a lot of evidence that comes out of work by people like Brandon Garrett and Peter Neufeld looking at post-conviction DNA exonerations where the initial conviction was based on forensic science. Uh, there's, there's a lot of evidence in that literature that the, that the forensic scientists who were you know, presenting what turned out to be misleading testimony in many cases were, uh, you know, may have been influenced by contextual biases themselves. Right? So there, you know, and I can elaborate on that if you're interested, but it's, but it's anecdotal. The problem of doing an eyewitness identification is ground truth. Uh, you can do laboratory research and there's been piles of it done, lots of it, because it's uh, relatively easy to do. Unfortunately, the, pro the problem is that you always know whether your target is guilty or innocent. So you can construct, the, and you're always going to be dealing with target present and target absent lineups that you know. Problem with the real world is you can't get a ratio of how many targets are innocent people and how many targets are guilty people. Uh, it, that, that ratio, which is very important, is extremely difficult to get, get hold of. And even eminent researchers use target selections as a proxy for accuracy. Even, and then they, they say, well, we know we can't do that because some of these targets are going to be 
inaccurate selections of innocent targets, but we just don't have any other way to get a hold of the data. Well, that's looking under the street light, uh, because even though the, the, the keys are in the alleyway, because there's light under the street light, right. but it doesn't answer the question you're asking. I wish as somebody in this audience could figure out a way to get leverage on that, uh, but so far, even people really smart, like Gary Wells, have been able to do it. So. Um, I can't. Yeah. I want to jump in and ask a quick question. That maybe you answered it with um, Bill. Your your comment about differentiation of roles with between a case manager and deciding sort of what to collect. But is one of the arguments made? So we've got you know a lot of this is happening in state and local labs. A lot of these labs are notoriously you know running on very slim budgets. Um, so is part of the problem here, at least from the lab analyst perspective, that they need to know the, enough of the facts of the case in order to decide what to test? We're talking about, you know, these could be messy crime scenes, lots of evidence coming in. Do I test this? Do I test, you know, they don't have the resources to run hundreds and hundreds of tests potentially. I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure if this is an argument or not. So is that part of the problem here, at least from their perspective, as to why they need to know at least some facts of a case? Um, well, it's certainly an argument for why, uh, yeah, so somebody, somebody has to know the facts of the case before deciding what, which, which of the many samples to test and what test to use on it. So somebody has to know that. It doesn't have to be the person who's interpreting the test, mm -hmm. unless it's a very small, like a one-person lab. I mean, I think the, you know, I think, I think the real reason is connected to the issues you raised earlier about lack of validation in forensic science. I mean, I think in many of these areas, as was pointed out by many people, there's, there, there's, ina there's an inadequate scientific foundation to know just how reliable these techniques are. And, and I think that forensic scientists resist blinding because they like to rely on the crutch of knowing other information about the case to help them reach, quote, the correct conclusion. And, and so I, I think that, um, you know, I think part of the reason we haven't validated the forensic sciences better is in part because analysts have maintained the discretion to shade their results one way or another according to what they think the truth is based upon their conversations with detectives. And that, that's my cynical perspective. Okay, maybe one more question maybe? I think we have almost out of time. Yeah. Example of the of the of the chest X-ray. Mm -hmm. So, should the similar case of blinding occur with the chest X-ray? So, when I order a chest X-ray for my patient coming with cough, I'm supposed to say on the ordering form, and it's, I know it's going to influence the radiologist, fever, weight loss, night sweats, or not. Should I should any of that contextual information be eliminated from that? And what's gained? What's lost in that process. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've looked a little bit at the, the clinical medicine literature on blinding, and I, I, I know there is, some, there is some literature that addresses this. I mean, there, there was one study done back in the 80s on um, interpretation of echocardiograms, and should the, should the technician uh, interpreting the echocardiograms be advised of the physician's diagnosis and the, and the patient's symptoms and, and other tests and so on. And, and, and the findings from that study were, was that the um, uh, the false positive rate uh, for, you know, false positives on the echocardiogram interpretation went way up when the uh, technician was exposed to the other evidence and that the, the, the diagnostic value of the echocardiogram, that is, you know, the likelihood ratio you would assign to that evidence per se, was higher if the technician was blind than if the technician was exposed to this other information. And I think it's partly due to the, the same process I talked about, about the, the other information uh, contaminates the expert's judgments in ways that undermine the independence of that judgment from the other evidence and reduce its um, incremental value to the decision maker. So um, now I don't know how widely uh, those, those kind of blinding regimes have been introduced in, in medicine, but at least in, you know, there's at least some literature supporting it. And I, and I think the, the issues are very similar to the ones we, we see in uh, forensic science. Um, I just want to ask, I don't want us to get too far behind schedule. We have a couple more questions. Can we, Chris? Is it okay to take two more questions or? Let's live them in person uh, during the break. So okay. Okay, thanks.